literary history effectively? How can one find dominant strands and modes of evolution when there is just simply so much raw material? One can't read it all. How might one adopt intellectual models from the social and natural sciences in order to help one's investigation? Can one draw maps or diagrams or trees that will help one isolate useful taxonomies? And how would one relate these again to transformations that take place within forms over time or across societies? How might one use scientific method to enable one to ask questions about literary shapes, relations, structures, and to do so not through the traditional modes of close reading, but through a distant reading, a kind of abstracted reading of a very large textual corpus? These are questions that, by design, make literary criticism into something like laboratory work extending the idea of the symposium into a form of interrogation fit for the 21st century, where new media bring more and more texts ever more available and searchable. Franco's mappings of literary history offer us new pathways, whether these allow us to understand better the social spaces traversed within a novel or the bumpy developments of different fictional genres and literary devices. There's much more that I could mention, including his sustainably thoughtful and provocative essays in New Left Review, or his dynamic editorship of the multi-volumed Il Romanzo, the novel, a comparative reassessment of this genre, truly planetary in compass. But I was asked to keep the introduction short, truncated, pruned. I do really like a speaker who just leads it off into metaphors. And so I'll just conclude by saying that I can't imagine a more perfect interlocutor for a session on experiments in the humanities than Franco Moretti, who will be speaking on network theory plot analysis. All right, so uh, how does a literary historian become interested in empirical study? Uh, very brief retrospective. For me, it began with evolution, and more specifically what, with one aspect of evolutionary theory, Ernst Meyer's theory of speciation, where geography plays a very large role in the origin of species. And so this made me think, well, why not try to make literary maps to investigate the origin of genres? So I started doing that, and then it turned out that maps were better if they were based not on a single text, but on a series of texts. And so I started extracting data from uh, um, novels, and uh, that was my first uh, attempt at some modest attempt at quantitative work, and it was modest because, first of all, it was instrumental. I mean, the data extraction was functional to making maps. I wasn't interested in the data as such, and then the quantities was, were very, very small, at least with the corpora I worked. I mean, you look, beginning and endings in Austin, sort of 12 instances, uh, young uh, Balzac's young heroes in Paris and their lovers, 20 foreign concepts in Russian novels or ideas, and other very small quantities. In parallel, I studied book history, and that was better, because their uh, uh, print runs, uh, translation flows, library holdings, these are much larger corpora. But the problem there was a different one, which is to say they all remained external to literary form. You can count how many novels, how many Gothic novels were published in the 1790s, what libraries held them, where they were translated, when, with what frequency. None of this tells you anything, but anything, about the Gothic as form. And for me, that was the whole point. That's why I had become interested in evolution in the first place, because it's such a powerful theory of form and how forms change. And instead, what happened to me uh, through the 90s was that when I was finding something interesting about form, as in some of the patterns in the maps, in the atlas, the quantities were very small. I mean, there was a very uh, not solid at all uh, basis. When the quantities were large, form disappeared. It was a very frustrating uh, trade-off. Then a few years ago, um, it changed the uh, um, sort of line of research. You must understand all of this happened to me. I mean, one, uh, the solution of one problem created another problem, which I found 
uh, which I think is a good thing. I mean, it means, you know, the process is uh, kind of fertile. It was completely unplanned. Unplanned was also the next step, which is uh, applying a quantitative approach to style. Initially, in a very, very elementary uh, form of even, you know, frequency searches on individual texts, at times, even those can be lucky. Due uh, the obscure, it turns out that the most frequent word, once you've uh, eliminated uh, function words, is Jude, then comes said, then comes Sue, and the fourth most frequent word is don't. And it's stunning, right? I mean, the repressiveness of an entire novel condensed in one word. In Middlemarch, to give you an instance, don't is the 30th most frequent word. That's where it usually stands. Here it's the fourth. But first, such luck is extremely rare, so you can't really build a research program on this. And then second, you don't do quantitative work in order to replace subjectively chosen details with statistically significant ones. I mean, you do quantitative work, or at least I decided to do that, in order to go beyond individual details altogether. And for me, this happened very, very recently with a study of 7,000 titles of British novels between 1740 and 1850, um, which should have appeared in Critical Inquiry already. Uh, I was told it would in September, and that's why you don't get that paper here. And I, I had, but it's not out, but it will be out soon. And in this study, 7,000 titles, uh, there are extremely good bibliographies for that period, so it's a kind of reliable starting point. It, uh, the first and fundamental finding was indeed quantitative, i.e., how much shorter titles become in those 40 years. You can see the uh, average length is between 10 and, 10 and 20 words per title in the first uh, 20 years. It drops to around 10 in 1770. It's around 9 by, the, uh, by 1790. And this is a rather striking general trend. All titles tend to become shorter. But the most dramatic things happen at the two ends of the spectrum, that is to say, uh, long tight, very long titles with 15 words or more uh, drop, the red dots drop from about 50% at the beginning of the period to 10% uh, or less by the turn of the century, whereas very short titles with just one, two, or three words used to be 5% and uh, sort of multiply up to around 25% by the turn of the century. And one type of short title abstractions like persuasion, pride and prejudice, uh, that title was what well, that type of title was very important because titles used to tell readers something about the story of the novel, you know, sort of a brief summary of the plot or the name of the heroine or settings, etc. Pride and Prejudice does none of this. What Pride and Prejudice does is point to the point of the novel. And uh, this matters because it changes the horizon of expectations around the form. The titles become a lot shorter. Yeah, it's neat, it's interesting, but in the end, so what? That by becoming shorter, they induce readers to look for a conceptual unity in the story. This is really a shift in perception, a major shift in perception. And it was finally one instance in which quantity and form clicked. A title made of two words was not the same thing as a title with 20 words divided by 10. It was a different thing. It worked differently. Quantity changed, so did form. So, this was recent, and uh, applying quantitative approach to style, not in order to replace one detail with another, but to turn details into series, and then take these series as your new object of knowledge. 